Good morning and welcome to Sunday special of explaining Sikhism. There has been a recent trend to create a divide between Sikhism and Hinduism and there is no denying the fact that although originally started uh, took roots from Hinduism, Sikhism did emerge as a separate religion. The same way as Christianity came out of Jewish religion, Judaism is the mother of Christianity, Hinduism mother of Sikhism, but then they become adults. Nevertheless, the philosophical inputs of one religion cannot in any way be cut off. That's an umbilical cord, you can cut it off, but the connection remains. And in literature, Sikhism is usually represented as syncretism. By syncretism I mean a combination of Islam and Hinduism. As a matter of fact, I plan to talk to you about the impact of Islam and Judaism on Sikhism. The cutting of the root does not in any way obviate that the Sikh religion is essentially Vedantic religion. And Vedanta is a philosophy taught by Veda, the most ancient scriptures of India. Now the basic remains the same, that our real nature is divine and God, the underlying reality, exists in everything. Hinduism emerged out of Vedantaism and then it branched out in Brahminical areas, absolute divide, and then in Jainism and Buddhism, which they had the same concept of a total divinity surrounding the cosmos. And religion therefore becomes a search for self-knowledge in the search for God within. Now that's Vedantic philosophy. And the Sikh philosophy basically has the same concept when in Japji Sahab Guru Nanak writes, Man Jite Jagji, if you can conquer your mind, your brain, your thoughts, you have conquered the world. That's the basic philosophy. Secondly, Sikhism is essentially, as I said earlier, pantheism. It worships God in various manifestations, earth, air, water, hills, trees. Each one has a divine significance. And if you look at the various interpretations of Adi Guru Granth, you will find that this philosophy is there. Second person of this philosophy is the philosophy of the Shab, the word. The word is much more important than anything else. And Gurbani has been interpreted in the past and has been presented that it is based on Vedantic philosophy. The basic concept of Vedanta remains inherent in all the Gurbani, so right from Guru Nanak to Guru Tegh Bahadur. Of course, Guru Gobind Singh had a different interpretation, though, but then if you look at his Savaya and his Chopai, you would find that it's premated by Vedanta philosophy. Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism in the 15th century, it then was the period of Renaissance in Europe and a period of Bhakti movement in India. At that time, scientists were challenging some of the concepts of church in Europe. And here was Guru Nanak. Now, that is something different. He was challenging the ancient mythology and rituals in which Hinduism had become sacred for centuries. So when he went to Hardwar, he preached against 
offering water to the sun. Not that he had any objection to worshipping the sun because he was, as I said earlier, a pantheist. It was he who said, Paman Guru Pani Pita, Mata Dhat Mat, that air is the teacher, earth is the mother. So if a person can regard those as parents and as guides and as philosophers, he would not challenging offering water towards the sun so that but he said no that's not possible it's not logical so here the Vedanta took a turn and that is where the main difference is that rationality and logic permeated Sikhism and that became the inherent part of Sikhism Guru Nanak promulgated a unique philosophy that is scientifically and logically very sound and now it's being universally accepted. You can call it an unkin philosophy though nobody has given this name but I'll prefer to call it not the Sikh philosophy but the nankin philosophy. The nankin philosophy basically is logic, reasoning, and most important mindfulness. Then this was strengthened and reached and preached. And the followers of this philosophy are known as Sikhs, meaning learned. So due to historical circumstances after the death of Guru Gobind Singh, there was systematic annihilation of Sikh population. And that was when the philosophy was pushed to the background. The outer form remained, but the inner core was not practiced for some time because unfortunately the Sikh places of worship fell under the control of Udasis and Nirmalas who created their own version of Sikhism. And this was then strengthened by the British conquest of Punjab. Then in the 1920s, the Sikh more liberation, the Gurdwara movement liberation started. And then from the theological point of view, there was a change from the Nankin philosophy. But one thing remained the same. The oppression against injustice, cruelty and wrongdoing remained an inherent part of Sikhism. Now at that time a Sikh philosopher came up by Kaun Singh of Naba and then according to him the old Sikh literature had been written according to the level and intelligence of the belief of that time. So it had a lot of useful information but it was colored by the time as I said yesterday each piece of writing is always colored by the contemporary social, cultural, educational, political milieu. You cannot divorce the writing from the surrounding atmosphere. So this statement of Baba Bhai Kaun Singh is valid. But then when he says, he wrote a book, Hum Hindu Nahi. Now look at the wording, hum, which is not a Punjabi word, it's basically Urdu word. And then it was incorporated in UP, in Hindi. Hum Hindu Nahi is apparently the impact of Hinduism is clear. Had it been a pure Punjabi, he would have said, Asi Hindu Nahi. So, Dancing, but he emphasized that the more important thing is the dearth of work, which was very important. Now here comes the average reader when you look at the Vedas. He goes for the mantras and they read the mantras as if they are a magic formula for secular benefit. But the reality is that those mantras of Vedas are basically a discipline for spiritual life and for achievement of ideals 
they can hire and beyond the cells and for integrity of mind and soul of the world being. So that is Vedas and that is Vedantic philosophy that mantras are to be used for upliftment and then that concept came into being. Then when Guru Gobind Singh said that the Alamut Gurus would take mother, that was that follow the teaching of Guru Granth, not just read it and forget it. And then, you know, another thing cropped up. People have forgotten it. If you see Upanishads, from where Guru Nanak used the word Omkar, you know, Omkar has been used in various Upanishads. Not only Om, but Omkar. But Guru Nanak added the numeral one to it. A Konkar. That confirms to the oneness of God. And that concept again is basically given in all the Upanishads. Some people say that Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, President of Sahitya Karmatji, he was criticizing Guru Nanak, but no, he was not. He was explaining that Guru Nanak inherited the Hindu culture, incorporated into the Sikh theology and the Sikh philosophy. It's ironic. And then, you know, the people of Punjab at that time, and many people out in Punjab, became conscious of the value of Guru Nanak's advent and his teaching. And what Guru Nanak did, he did not build up a religion, but he organized the thought pattern of a very important religious persuasion. And that was based on foundations of Vedantic monotheistic jnana and Puranic bhakti. So bhakti and jnana, they were the base of Sikhism. Later on Guru Hargobind gave it a martial thought when he talked of Miri Piri. He was the first man to talk that the temporal and the spiritual values go together. If you don't have temporal authority, you can't have spiritual authority. We have got to notice that the faith preached by Guru Nanak was nothing new for India. It was basically the own monotheistic creed of the ancient Hindus. Not of the Hindus who believed in 33,000 gods, no. But one god, manifestation through the Trimurti. And this concept of Trimurti has been adopted in Sikhism. When Guru Gopal Singh says, De Shiva Varmohe Shukkar Mante Kabamukhikaru, he believes that when he goes and writes in Bhachitar Natak that he was praying at Hemkund for a long period. And why at Hemkund? Because that's our abode of Shiva as well, near the Shiva's abode. So that concept of monotheistic jnana and Puranic bhakti led with the worship of the one God. That was important. And this monotheistic base was fortified as a matter of fact in simple form as the bhakti movement, which was the faith inculcated in the later Puranic Hinduism. So this thing continues. Of course, if you look at the rituals, you will find Although most of the rituals were Hindus, but then they changed. And as I said, I'll take it up separate day. But then one thing you've got to understand, Sikh, Pan, Sikh religion has nothing to do with the ritualistic part. It's a philosophy all right. It was nothing but a reformed, simplified part. And as far as the philosophy of Vedanta is concerned, if you look at it, the Sikh philosophy is easily understood when you look at the Vedanta philosophy, oneness of God, God permitting everything, and then reasoning and logic. If you look at the talks of Guru Nanak, 
discussions of Guru Nanak with Bhats, with Rishis and other Munis, you would find his talk is purely logical. He goes to Makkah, his feet are pointing towards Kaaba. The priest, Mullah, tells him, why are your feet pointing towards God? He says, okay, turn my feet, drag my feet where the God is not there. And when the Guru is pulled on the other side, his leg, the Kaaba moves. That's a story, of course. But the purpose is to show that Kaaba is not the sole repository of God. God is, but then Muhammad himself said so. It is later on that the Muslims solidified that because that's required. Guru, none of the Guru said that Guru is only in the Gurdwara. They thought his premates everywhere. So this Vedantic philosophy premates Sikhism. That's undeniable, but as I said, there's, there's one major difference. Vedanta philosophy does not stress the importance of work. But Kirtkaro is an important part. Kirtkaro is work honestly. One chako, distribute whatever you do. That's socialism. That's socialistic aspect. The working aspect is missing in Vedanta. And that is inherent part of Sikhism as well. So earlier traditions continued, but they were changed. And though it's very expensive to think of that, the Sikh scholars have not tried to study that and have just followed the stream. One stream says it's pure dependent on Hinduism, which it is not. It draws from there and then it's reinforced by reason, logic, thought. And this is basically a composite whole of philosophy. At times, when you read Gurbani, for example, in Sukhmani, the whole concept is basically doing good. The Sikhs would have the Sukhmani part and they'll recite it without thinking that are they incorporating those values in their lives. So the philosophical aspect, if we look at Sikhism, is Vedantic essentially, but modified according to the need of the time with reason, logic, thought and circumspection. And then, if you read the Vedanta philosophy exemplified today by Vivekananda, you would find the intrinsic affinity in the two. Of course, they are not the mirror image of each other. Now, let's for people when they say that is Vedanta thing is a mirror image. It's not, and no philosophy can be a mirror image of another philosophy. Though the undercurrents, the patterns might be identical. And that is what is between Sikhism and Vedanta. Thank you.